I was in Virginia for work and on the way back conducted some research on Daniel Boone and the Cumberland Gap for a possible upcoming video. While traveling, I listened to the audiobook Dereliction of Duty by H.R. McMaster, and I highly recommend it if you are interested in the Vietnam War. The retired Army three-star general pulls no punches in this brilliantly researched and engaging book. A couple of things jumped out at me. Number one, I have to and I will go to Vietnam in 2025. I have been waffling back and forth on making a firm decision, but now I'm committed. More on that in the future. That's right. Fuck it. Number two, what resonated with me was how he approached his research and narrative very subtly using the strategic framework of ends, ways, and means. Now, you're probably asking yourself, what the hell are ends, ways, and means, and why should I care? Ends, ways, and means is a framework that the military uses to formulate strategy and plan operations. I myself have used it for many years now to study military history and uncover insights, and I've also used it in my personal uh, work. You can use it for a number of endeavors, studying military history, understanding commercial operations, or even planning your next trip, like I did when I went to Normandy in October of 2023. In this video, I'll give you a quick introduction to the topic and show how LBJ Secretary of Defense McNamara and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the JCS, botched the strategy in Vietnam. We will also take a look at a real-world planning dysfunction using an example from Operation Rolling Thunder and also dismiss some of the criticisms of this framework. One of the most important tasks for any organization is to align on operational terms and their definitions. Ends are the goals or objectives you seek to attain. Here are a couple of questions to ask as you think through this or help others think through this. What is your end state? How do you define success? Ways are the methods you are going to use to achieve your ends. A common technique is to state your ways as a verb ending in ing. For example, many organizations today are trying to achieve their goals, their ends, by automating business processes, reducing human capital costs, optimizing social media spend. We've got to protect our phony baloney job, gentlemen. We must do something about this immediately. Means are the resources and requirements that allow you to support the ways. These can be nouns or verbs. A personal note here about means, or rather the lack thereof. In January of 2003, the Army mobilized me to teach the operations process to Reserve and National Guard units deploying overseas. As part of that mission, my unit tasked me and another armor officer to provide a mission analysis seminar to a central command unit, the 244th Aviation Brigade. As we prepared for the mission, and reviewed the CENTCOM plan to invade Iraq, we looked at each other in disbelief and wondered out loud who in the hell put this plan together with so few combat units. The ends were clear, the ways were clear, but the means, as history tells us, left something to be desired. There you have it, a brief overview of the framework. Let's now apply this to the early phases of the Vietnam War. When the French left Indochina after the 1954 Geneva Accords, the United States filled the power vacuum in what became South Vietnam. So what were the ends? Johnson administration would repeatedly state that they wanted a stable, independent, non-communist South Vietnam. Stated, although a bit more privately, was that they wanted to maintain America's international credibility. These seem reasonable. But over time, fewer civilian and military advisors believed an independent South Vietnam was viable, and the whole endeavor became about saving face. 
Now on to the ways. By 1965, with South Vietnam on the edge of collapse, LBJ, McNamara, and a reluctant Joint Chiefs of Staff agreed to the overall concept of what is known as graduated response. This involved the incremental application of military force as needed to achieve the goals. The core idea was to avoid overwhelming force and communicate to Hanoi America's resolve. Two separate Department of Defense war games showed that this kind of incrementalism would only strengthen Hanoi's resolve while undermining the fragile South Vietnamese government. LBJ and his advisors kindly ignored those results. As such, here is just one of the ways within the concept of graduated response. Slowing the flow of supplies and soldiers from North to South Vietnam. What other ways can you think of? I believe it was Ronald Reagan that had the way of turning North Vietnam into a parking lot or words to that effect. Now on to the means, and we're just going to focus on stopping the flow along the Ho Chi Minh Trail in an incremental fashion. So who do we need? What do we need? And where do we need it? Well, how about having the CIA conduct covert operations throughout the theater? Having U.S. aircraft attack targets in Laos and North Vietnam, south of the 19th parallel. This is actually what became known as Operation Rolling Thunder, which started March 2nd, 1965. And then we're going to have to have a way of doing battle damage assessment with U-2s, SR-71s. Actually, I just recently saw a presentation that the CIA had two or three SR-71 aircraft that were supporting the mission in, in Vietnam. Of course, you're going to need troops to secure the air and logistics bases. And that actually led to the Marines landing in Da Nang. And with all these troops and planes, you're going to need massive amounts of logistics. Indeed, the Joint Chiefs recommended mobilizing the reserves. On a side note, the Army estimated it would take 500,000 troops at least five years to defeat the insurgency. And then there's this LBJ statement about Kilmore Viet Cong. He even demanded a report of VC dead on his desk each week. Never forget what you measure drives behavior. Is LBJ's request for body count a mean? Is it a way? Or did he in some twisted fashion turn an off-handed request into an overarching end? This flawed strategy was exacerbated by a planning process that was a mixture of micromanagement and bureaucratic dysfunction. A typical example is Rolling Thunder Program 20, RT-20, scheduled for June of 1965. Let me apologize in advance for this slide, but it does capture the reality. The JCS sent a list of 14 targets to McNamara, who immediately removed six. He then sent the remaining eight to the State Department, to one of his deputies, John McNaughton, and then that list back to the JCS. The JCS then sent a draft target plan to the Commander-in-Chief Pacific. The State Department objected to one of the targets because of worries about collateral damage, while McNaughton recommended keeping it on the list. McNamara sided with State and removed it. Finally, on June 23rd, the president sat down with his advisors to personally approve the targets, which he did. Not one person from the military was present. Six days after their initial proposal, the JCS sent the final list of seven targets to the Commander-in-Chief Pacific, who would forward that to Military Assistance Command Vietnam. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to try this framework out on a situation you face. If you have any questions, comment down below or send me an email, which is on the channel's homepage. Now, there are academics that are critical of the framework, saying it stifles creativity, that it's not what grand strategy is about, etc., etc. It seems like they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The bottom line is you need a common framework as a starting point for mutual understanding. And that's what this framework does. Also, one should never blame a tool when it is used improperly by the ones using it. Let me close with this. I recommend you look at this clip 
on the air war in Vietnam. It was a presentation made several years ago by Dr. Mark Claude Felter, who is a professor of military strategy at the National War College. I think you will find it very eye-opening. Link is in the description. Here's a brief snippet from it. Charlie Mike. I look under the wings and I went, hmm, that's different. I go up to the crew chief and I say, you know, you guys are usually pretty good, but this time, for some reason, you forgot to put bombs on my airplane. And crew chief pulls out his clipboard and goes, uh, we don't have any bombs for your airplane, sir. He goes, I'm attacking the Tanwa Bridge. Where are the bombs? Crew chief says, I don't know, sir. We don't, we don't have any list. Pilot goes running into the tower, cracks down the CAG, and goes up to him and he says, Sir, uh, what's my mission for today? And CAG looks at him and says, Tanwa Bridge. He says, uh, Sir, are you aware that there's no bombs on my aircraft? CAG says, Yeah. And the pilot looked at the CAG and said, Sir, what am I supposed to do? And CAG looked him in the eyes and said, When you get there,